This is David Morgan, the Morgan Report.com. I have John Force Little with me, and we are going to file this under the Silver Psyop. John, you always do such interesting work, and it's always a pleasure to speak with you. I'm glad you reached out and captured my attention way back when you started, and it was a lot of fun. And I think we've got a lot to discuss. So uh, I think. You can see my screen now. Is that correct? You to... Yes, sir. Thank you, Dave. It's good to be with you. Okay. So the title of this latest piece is, is what? Do you have a title for this? I'm calling it Mind Control and we'll cir- and the fundamental value of gold and silver. But you'll see how it has the subtitle, Mind Control. So you want to say anything about uh, Denarius here? That was... Sure. I think it's important to see that whether you're talking about Athens, and we got to remember that Athens heyday was, they were conquered by Rome, but Athens in the Bronze Age minted the first coins, the coins of Lydia, and they used them to pay their soldiers, and then they expanded in that area near west, western Turkey, around the Mediterranean. Rome comes in, and their first emperors do real well as far as the not debasing the currency. So all I'm showing here is that during the times of peace, the, there's great purity in 98% pure coins. And then as they need more money to go to war and some other public works, they begin debasing the currency. And that's, you'll see in the next few charts. And I'm gonna then bring that into an analogy of modern day times, whereas as we go down into the right, we're showing that the, um, by, by the time we get to the collapse of their empire, there's hardly any silver left in the coins. And this, as it goes down to the right, and if, that brilliant quote is, make the soldiers rich and pay no attention to everyone else. And as you see in the next chart, just as it went down to the right, this goes up and to the right. So you can either, and when I think of the inflation, I always want to think, are we, inflate, I think the latest charts I've seen is, you know, 80% of the money that's ever been printed, it's been printed in the last 22 months. So you can either print more coins or, or, or notes or debase what you have. It's the same thing. So since 1945, most people don't realize how often we've been at war and we've been at war constantly since the 1600s even prior to being a, a nation in 1776, we've been at war for almost every year except for 16. And even in, since Vietnam, people, don't, they always think of Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq. But there's also been Somalia, Yemen, Pakistan. Um, they're really not Nicaragua, Cuba. And the patterns usually or always is to increase your sphere of influence politically. We always say it's to promote democracy, but it's really an effort to grab the resources of usually the Southern hemisphere and to add value to those resources here through marketing and then to sell back to the world markets. Exactly. Let me interject, John. It's uh... John Perkins' book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, you know, where they, they, the CIA, the government go in and basically make a deal with the dictator or the ruler of a certain country, make them rich and uh, exploit them, uh, put them into debt. You owe us the debt because you can't pay it back. We're going to take your resources. That's a thumbnail sketch, fairly accurate. And uh, John was one of the first people that um, I ran into. I've never met him, but on the internet, uh, I go, man, this guy's got some guts to stand up and talk about it. You know, there's not too many people will. Most people don't understand it. I, they get the mainstream news only, and they believe we're spreading freedom, which is makes me laugh because it's not true. Well, we'll get into later job. why some of the talking points are always going to be words like democracy, freedom. And we'll see that, like your friend had alluded to, there was an old theory. I learned it at University of New Mexico in the 80s. They called power elite theory. 
And it was based, even Eisenhower, a somewhat conservative president, one of his farewell addresses was warning the nation of this new power that mm -hmm. the, the military industrial complex. So in this graph, all we're showing is that this circle of, you know, printing coins to subsidize the army, but then you, with this lust for power, you always have to find sort of a new colony to exploit. Um, then the circle goes loot, loot them. And then you take that revenue to print more coinage. And as long as you're not debasing the coinage, you can, this cycle can feed on itself for quite some time. So that's all that is. And if we, if we go back two slides, David, to showing the, or three, showing that continuum down where it really starts one more back, where it really drops off from around 200 AD to their collapse is when, and now we've got to go forward, <laughs> sorry. Bruce, you're going to have to edit this. I'm so sorry. Um, right there. When we started seeing cracks in their empire is when they started with the civil wars. And our modern day civil, yeah, we had the one in the 1800s here, North versus South, which they say was over slavery, but it was also over um, the tariffs. South wanted to stop buying from the North. But now we're divided in as a people over today, the big news story was Roe versus Wade. But the news, the 24 seven news cycle will change every 48 hours. And then we'll fight over climate change, um, school textbooks, teaching critical race theory, you know, Disney being woke or not woke. Um, and it's uh, voting rights in Georgia was the big deal. Who's going to, do we need our driver's license to show up to the polls? Are they suppressing the vote? And it's just, you know, pivoting day after day to distraction to distraction. You know, I always say that, well, you know, who's Justin Bieber married to or who's Taylor Swift dating or, you know, what's Kim Kardashian up to? What's the latest cosmetic surgery? Who's on American Idol tomorrow night? It, and it never stops. So these are just sort of the cultural wars that are playing out within the United States to keep us from not focusing on the real war, which should be a class war between the ruling class and the rest of us. So if those are the things that they want to talk about, what are, what are the things we should be talking about? And it's we can see right now with this war in Ukraine, the way the world is lining up, you've got every other country but USA, Europe, South Korea, Japan, and Australia lining up for a better system because the West has had nothing but a financialized banking system. It was, the old banking system was, I go to the bank and if I owned a factory or a farm, they would loan me the money. And then when the crops you know, yielded or the widgets manifested themselves, they would get their money back in interest. But now the way banks are working, we can actually repackage bad debt or what they call non-performing loans. And those become through a double entry system, an asset that's sold to another bank. And Dave, are you familiar with these reverse repo swaps? And the Absolutely. Yes, okay, because it's mind boggling to me. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I think you explained it enough. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far, but you know, let's just I'll reiterate it. You take a bunch of uh, non-performing loans, which is really deadbeat loans, they'll probably never be paid off. You put a bundle of them together, you mark them at a certain credit rating, and then you sell it as an asset. And then that asset can be used to leverage into other loans. And then, I mean, it gets into the best way to look at it, I think, to get a better explanation is to look at the movie The Big Short and talk about credit default swaps and uh, credit default obligations. And then they had CDO squared. I mean, it gets to be so absolutely ridiculous that it's beyond belief, but it exists. In the big short movie, the, the in the film, there's people behind the two principals that are at the blackjack table that are making the primary bets. And then behind them, there's bets going on on the bets that they're making. And behind them, there's people making bets on the bets of the people behind the bettors. And then it just goes on and on and on. So, so those would be your layers of 
der derived or it, derivatives. Derivatives. And, think, and it's all based on a, a, a package of crap. I right. mean, a non-performing loan. So, you know, not all of them are, but uh, a lot of them were in the 2007, 8, 9 financial collapse, uh, financial crisis. The mainstream even calls it a crisis. So I think we got that covered, John. Let's go ahead and move on here. Um, um, I want to stick on the okay, one slide there about energy is a big deal. Sure. As we've been outsourcing to <clears throat> mostly South Asia, including India, Latin America, Africa, and China, we've created this emerging class where people have been lifted out of poverty into the middle class. Now, if you take India, they only have 5% of their structures air conditioned. And now that they're in the middle class, they want things that anyone in the middle class wants, air conditioning, refrigerators, washer and dryers, mobile phones. And we haven't priced that into the grid as far as what future demand looks like. And guys like Stephen St. Angelo spend the whole day documenting how much natural gas we have, how much oil we have, how much diesel we have. And this is where we get to sort of this energy cliff and how that'll impact the new monetary system, which is on the next slide. And there's been, and back to those banks, by the way, they are 20 to 30 times leverage now, where I guess when you look at fractional reserve banking, it's not supposed to exceed eight to one, and it's now 20 to 30 to one. So we know where that's going to end. So where are we going to get the food would be the third talking point. And it's interesting that if China and Russia and Brazil and some of these countries have been watching the U.S. in QE mode, printing you know $120 billion a month, $90 billion in treasury bonds, $30 billion in mortgage-backed securities, they don't want any part of this leverage system, this financialized banking system, because it hasn't even been priced in, it hasn't gone through one rate height cycle yet. So they've been flocking to a better system where they're pegging the, the yuan and the ruble to a basket of, of about 20 commodities. And the chart on the bottom there just shows how well these commodities are doing, natural gas, gold, silver. And it's interesting because they don't, usually don't say, the, no one talks about their gold. The gold's in their basket. It's just something the US doesn't talk about their gold. China doesn't talk about their gold, but we know that China and Russia and India together have a lot more gold and silver than the U.S. does, a lot more. So if those are things we're not talking about, we're not talking about banks on the brink of failure, we're not talking about the ruble's rise against the dollar, the fact that yen has lost an enormous amount of strength in the last since the war started and before, how the euro is circling the drain. Uh, where's Germany going to get their energy? These are the things we talk about instead. You know, the Oscars. You know, I can find a thousand articles on crypto every single day with celebrities endorsing it. And the fact that Facebook's even selling property in the metaverse and that people would go for that. So now I want to get into what should we be focusing on and what are some of the tricks that are used by the ruling class to keep us distracted. And the prevailing thought has always been that the people in the past were stupid and that the people on the other side of the globe are stupid. Um, on the left there, I show, you know, they were so stupid, they would drill into your skull to let the evil spirits out. Or they were so stupid that they would burn women to the state's stake um, because they were witches. And yes, those were looking back in time, those are very ignorant things, very cruel things, very inhumane things, very savage things. But we're really no better today if you look at what's just happened in the last four years, where we had the NIH and the EcoHealth Alliance get together and fund some research in Wuhan, China, to humanize mice um, to and see if they would be um, susceptible or carry a virus, 
using their humanized lungs that would be not only lethal, but also very contagious. And this was the birth of COVID. And I, I wanna talk about some other savage things that we're doing right now that never gets any press. They, they may get one day of press and they go away. So let's look at some of those things and exactly who's employed to, this was the father. I mean, propaganda has been around forever. Winston Churchill said it best that in war, the first casualty is uh, true. The truth is the first casualty of war. So Sigmund Freud's nephew was a guy named Edward Bernays, and he wrote a book called Crystallizing Public Opinion and another book called Propaganda. And his big clients were United Fruit, Lucky Strike, but he also worked for the CIA because lots of times we need help at home to sell the war. Like what's going on right now, I was looking at MSNBC on the left, Fox on the right, CNN somewhere in the middle, CNBC, MSNBC, Bloomberg. No one has ever brought up the narrative that the war in Ukraine was started by U.S. pushing eastward. And after the Berlin Wall fell down, we were not supposed to expand eastward, just like we freaked out when they pushed into Cuba, because our Monroe Doctrine says, you cannot, this is not happening, you cannot push into our hemisphere. And here we are expanding east. So we have to hire people, and they're called advertising agencies, or they write press releases. And Bernays did a great job of controlling, he, w- he wrote a newsletter to all the UPI and AP reporters. And they're busy people or they're, or they were lazy and they would just read basically the news feed that was spun. You could call it advertorial. You could call it news, but in some cases it led to like in Guatemala toppling, just like you said earlier, Dave, about the regime that may be we, where we would install a tin pot dictator, give him some cash and they, United Fruit Company owned all of the arable land. It was over 95% of the arable land in Guatemala and set up all of that for export. Same thing with Argentina had to export for cat food, you know, Chile and Peru, copper. And right now in Mexico, it's interesting where the La Bamba mine, they're starting to say, well, we're not sure we want to go down this path where our silver is getting exported to miners owned in owned and operated out of us and canada most mostly so that's an introduction into oh on on bernays he basically started the campaign where uh, lucky strike and a few other manufacturers of tobacco didn't think enough women were smoking it was considered sort of anti-feminine so he tied the women's voting rights movement women's suffrage to light up a torch of freedom and took what was a zero percent market share of women or only half of the U.S. population by bringing women up to match men and smoking, you double the sales for Lucky Strike. So, John, I just want to back up a little bit. I'm not going to change the screen, but comment about the war. Look, we, the U.S., had a contract, as you said, and we're not going to expand. And we broke our word. So if we didn't break our word, we wouldn't be at war. It's that simple. You know, people well, can't be that simple. Yes, it can. And that takes us, and we're going to, I'm going to digress just a moment. I don't want to get too much time on this, John. But, you know, when we met, we had a couple of long talks, let's say, and got to know each other. And one is, of course, the expansion of the Europeans into the continent of the United States. And our, every treaty, is, to the best of my knowledge, every treaty that was ever made with the Native Americans was broken. So you can have this land and you can't go beyond this river. And then they broke that promise. And then they make another one. Well, if you go over here and only hunt this much, then we'll leave you alone. And they break that promise and on and on it goes. So in in my estimation, there's been no one that's probably been uh, exploited more. And we've talked about exploitation all the way through, uh, you know, what's happened in uh, Guatemala with the fruit company and all this stuff. But you go back to the beginning of this continent as we're taught, 
and the Native Americans have just been decimated, and it all has to do with us, the Europeans, not keeping their word. So I want to spend too much time on that, John. I just wanted to back you up that, uh, you know, a lot of these things that are negotiated, you know, well, let's have peace, you know, let's work this out, let's sit down and talk, and let's, and people sign it, and, you know, once the ink's dry, if someone breaks the promise, then what good is it? So I won't go further than that. <clears throat> Let's go on here. Back to you in the Ministry of Truth. Yeah, and please interrupt me. This is just something that I don't understand why when you turn on the news and you don't get any of the reporting that we spoke previously regarding, this one sort of blown up on Twitter verse or maybe on Wall Street Silver, some of these subgroups that that some precious metal people are interested in, but this is hauntingly familiar to have a department that controls the narrative and to come out. I think they're calling it the disinformation committee. What are they calling it, David? I Something like that. I'm not sure the exact title and their job. So Jen Psaki comes out yesterday and says, we just have to get in front of flagging these problematic posts. And I thought it was funny when I read that, you know, I'm going to stop calling them conspiracy theories and start calling them spoiler, you know, spoiler alerts, because that's sort of how they're playing out. And this goes back I, later. You'll see some slides I have on 9-11. And let's get right into those, because there's been four or five bombshell reports that just have not been reported left to right. This the one on the left was a artwork by The New Yorker. And in the 80s, we had, after the Congress said, we're not giving you money to fight a popular, a dip or a democratically elected government in Nicaragua. So the, the money was not given to the US military. So the CIA basically funded these rebels in Nicaragua by selling crack cocaine in the LA ghettos. I mean, you can't make that up. We always heard that there was this war on drugs. Drugs are bad. Drugs will lead to suicide. Drugs lead to crime on the streets. You know, you saw Dragnet when you were a kid, right? And Jack Webb would roll up on somebody and said, you know, you're high on smack, binnies, whiteies, white crosses, you know, speed bombs, whatever. And now we, and it's a problem. But we were, the U.S. turned into drug dealers to fund a, an illegal war. The middle screen is, I work with architects and engineers every day. They do not sign off on anything when it comes to their building plans and permits and their specifications. They are extremely careful. It may take them, in fact, to even get them on the phone, I have to fill out a request for information just to get them to answer a question I may have about clay or ceramics or anything in the building envelope. So here we had the, a guy named Richard Cage that started the Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth because they could see that when the 9-11 happened, that Building 7 came down in what's called a controlled demolition. The building just fell in its own footprint. And for that to occur, takes months of careful planning, not as long as it takes to build Building 7, but at every intersection, wherever there was horizontal and vertical um, structural support, that someone had to plant a device. And, and then they have to go off in the right sequence. And these guys have gathered data of all the firemen and police that were there that day. They were said it went bang, 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 bang. It wasn't like a single plane smashing into the uh, World Trade Center, and they know that there wasn't enough heat generated from that that would make the building next to it or behind it go down in this controlled demolition. So he gathered signatures of a bunch of architects and engineers, and it's a, in the thousands, David. And it ran, the news story ran for like a day or two, and then it just disappeared. So if we've been lied to about things like, you know, funding street thugs in LA to sell crack cocaine, or blowing up our own World Trade Center, I say that leads to the last picture of that was the provocation we used to go into Saddam's 
Iraq. And by the way, he was not trading in the petrodollar, just so you know. Um, to invent a war, there was no weapons of mass destruction ever found. And look at all the gold that was looted. And it's no different than we, this history has always played out. Cortez stole the gold from the Aztecs. Pizarro took less than 200 men into um, Inca territory and they sold, stole 24 tons of gold. The room Pizarro, or the room that the Inca leader was held in was filled with gold and the adjacent two were filled with silver. 24 tons, that's more than Finland has vaulted. They did it in a weekend. Just a couple quick comments. One, I'm a personal friend of Richard Gage. <laughs> Are you really? <laughs> house a couple times yes and then back to the cia with the drugs in la that was brought to the public by a guy with more guts than me his name was michael rupert and he used to write uh, i think it was out of the wilderness was his newsletter quite a man and uh, he actually confronted the i think it was the la council meeting with the drug infestation of the poorer sections of Los Angeles and was cheered. It's probably still on the web somewhere. Maybe not. It may have been cleansed, but I just wanted to shout out that you're exactly right. And there's, there are people in this country that are willing to stand up. Not a lot, but you don't need a lot. You just need the truth. There's nothing more powerful than the truth. I've said it many times. Michael Rupert brought the truth of this drug infestation into LA from the CIA and had all the documentations. And it was so interesting watching this film of it and some of the um, leadership, I'll call it, at the front table were wringing their hands. And, well, you know, we'd have to have some documentation and, you know, this is hearsay and, you know, trying to act big and powerful and knowledgeable. Because here it is, we had a stack of paper like this, you know. There you go. Have a look. And I, and I think it, there were wars. I mean, everybody remembers World War II. We went in to fight Hitler. That seemed, and that obviously there are times where a war like that's justified. I just can't think of one since World War II. Yeah. Um, that's just, as a student of political science, I haven't seen it. All right. Never see this story on Fox, MSNBC, CNBC, or CNN. Yeah, what's your take on just the fact that we even have a law in the books that would allow members of Congress after intelligence briefings that are classified to go run out and buy and sell stocks? I don't, is that sound like democracy to anyone listening right now? No, it's really sad. Uh, but this is, as we've talked about, and I've said before we met, it's a parallel to the Roman Empire. I mean, when you go back on the honest money, the senators really were, really was a republic, it functioned well. The senators actually had a heart and were actually representing the people, more or less. And at the end, they were all self serving scumbags that were getting as much as a personal gain as they possibly could. And it's reflected here with uh, all these Congress critters, red and blue. You know my take on politics. I'm equally discriminatory. I dislike them all equally. Right. And, um, you know, it's red red wing, blue wing, still attached to the same bird, flying basically the same way. It may slow down or speed up or go higher or lower, but the direction's very clear. And it's outside the purview of what most people think is the power base, which is the government. A government is run by the cortocracy, it's the fascism, which is really the corporate structure runs the government. And that's the way it is. And what runs the, the, uh, the corporations are the banks. So, you know, I've always said over and over what the real setup is. And most people don't go beyond, you know, the president is the most powerful, important person in the world. Well, give me a break. Well, Mayor Rothschild purportedly said, you know, give me the power to create money and I care not who makes the laws. Right. That sums it up. If I can make the money and government borrows money from the bankers. And I think everyone that would listen to John Little or David Morgan knows that. But we're the, the people are on the hook for the money that your government borrows from a private corporation. So I won't. Take over here, John. It's an excellent graph. Greed, 
I wanted to jump in on that point where you talked about the bankers and the relationship with the ruling class. In the 1600s, when the king wanted to fight France, so this is how the Bank of England started. They wanted to fight France. The king didn't have the money to fight France. 40 businessmen in England step up, loan 1.2 billion, excuse me, 1.2 million pounds to the king of England to fight the war against France with the understanding, though, they, they had leverage on the king that you allow us now to establish this Bank of England, which will have the monopoly on issuing these banknotes to the public. So once you have that monopoly in the Federal Reserve kind of negotiated the same deal when the U.S. government was bankrupt to privately, I think J.P. Morgan was the head of that at the time, but I don't have my Federal Reserve history down like I should. Okay. All right. Well, we can move on here. Yeah. Now, this well, is this is what I just want to interject a little. You told me slightly uh, about this. I found it really a fascinating take on looking at it because it goes right along with the way that uh, my friend Steve St. Angelo looks at what you call embedded energy. I'm just not sure his terminology, but it's basically the same idea. So carry on, John. I want to learn more. No, that's good. I mean, Steve is for years was talking about energy and we all get so caught up on the cup and handle formation and the Fibonacci curve and the Elliott wave and all these technical analysis and the gold to silver ratio and the banks are screwing us by manipulating. But in a way, the more they sell, which suppresses the value of gold, gold has a way of standing alone in nature and what Steve talks about as far as being a store of energy. And the best way I found on to, to convey this and explain this is if it takes 250 watt hours, this is the slide on the left, to make 100 grams of chocolate. So this, this bar of chocolate is roughly the same value as that same amount of energy would be 250 watt hours to make 20 kettles of pasta. And throughout nature, you can go through any single building material, for instance, whether it's stucco, concrete, brick, wood, PVC, copper piping, um, paint even, and they all have a number assigned based on how many kilojoule, kilojoule is the unit, a joule is a very small amount of energy to make a kilogram. So it doesn't matter what the conversion is, but gold, whereas bricks, which took a lot. I mean, I used to be in that business. We would mine a pound of clay or more than that, feed it through the extruder, um, then cut it in with wires into four by eight pieces, stack it on railroad cars. It would take four days to go through a kiln that's a hundred yards long and then have to stack it, then package it, ship it to the job site. And our energy bill was fifty to sixty thousand dollars a month. Now it's up to one fifty thousand a month, and they only had a score of four for for brick because it's basically low embodied energy. A pound of building material from Mother Earth translates into a pound of uh, building material into the wall, but gold has a score of thirty one thousand. So that puts it at I think steals it around. 40,000, but it's, it's something to think about that's never talked about is how it's, we talk about its intrinsic value or its beauty or that it's rare. But I just wanted to bring up the fact that the embodied energy unit is something we can all agree is having this intrinsic value. And somehow they knew about it back in, in whether it's in, whether it was Rome, Athens, Spain, conquering Latin America, we all arrive at the fact that in the end of the day, silver and gold, um, not digits on a screen like Bitcoin, not fiat currency, which I believe costs, I forgot, I think even Steve even brought up the formula of what it costs to print a hundred dollar bill, but it's- That's like five cents. I thought it was five cents too. I wasn't yeah. gonna guess. Yeah. So, so then we what are your final that. thoughts? 
to go. I guess if, if we bring it all home, rest assured that gold and silver have their value. It's happening as we see Western banks, and I mean US, Europe, and Japan fail because they're tethered to debt. We will see the emergence of a commodity based currency. And yes, it's orchestrated by Russia and China right now, but the country sitting on the sideline, like Italy, excuse me, India, um, Brazil, Israel, Saudi Arabia, most of Africa, most of Latin America, i.e. the rest of the world is lining up and they don't want anything. They don't want anything to do with this currency, the petrodollar, which is tied to all the debt and fractionalized banking and repackaging non-performing loans. They want to go with the basket of 20, 20 uh, commodities, which, which are backed by gold. So we, I'm not going to go out and buy the ruble tomorrow but I can buy gold. I can hold gold, historically undervalued and silver. So that looks like the last slide, am I correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to wrap this up. First of all, I told you we put the sun in the silver psyop and John Perez was the one that actually coined that title, which I'm fine with. And with all due respect to John, which I really like John a lot, the silver psyop he talks about in his own way, but I just will broaden it slightly. The psyop is that paper has value. The psyop is that something on the computer has value. Now, I'm not saying Bitcoin doesn't, but inherent intrinsic value, well, there's energy used in it. So does it or does it not? I'll leave that to the viewer because some will say yes, some will say no, and some will be undecided. But when it comes down to the precious metals, they've existed for thousands of years. And as Steve did in one of his uh, articles, he talked about how the Roman Empire ran out of not only silver uh, or money, but uh, how it wasn't just debasing the currency, which of course is primary, it was the fact that they were running out of energy. They were cutting down so many trees to smelt but they're starting to run out of trees. So it's very similar from a broader base perspective that we're running out of oil, uh, cheap oil anyway. And because of that energy cliff that Steve talks about so often, we are going to see an increase in the amount of energy required to produce a kilo of gold. Why? Because the input costs are going to be higher and higher and higher. Import inputs being primarily energy, diesel, transportation, equipment's run, and also labor will probably be screaming for higher wages because the currency is being debased at such a rapid rate that they're not able to feed their families, so then why go to work? So they're going to demand higher wages, and this becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy where Gasoline, oil costs more, diesel costs more, food costs more, need more wages. That pushes everything up even more, and it ends badly. So that is one scenario. That's an inflationary depression. That's probably, at this point, the most likely. But we can also have a countervailing force, meaning that as interest rates go higher, the bond market loses value because it's an inverse correlation. The higher interest rates go, the less a current bond is worth. So if you have a bond that's yielding 2% and interest rates go to 5%, that current bond is discounted to yield the 5% that's the going rate of interest. Yeah. And the last comment is the way that we always get into this situation is by borrowing short and lending long. Borrowing short and lending long works until it doesn't work. And that means you can borrow it near term at 2% a year and loan it long term at 4% a year. So you get a 2% spread. You borrow now at 2%, you throw that money out the further duration and you're getting twice the yield. Well, it's all make-believe these days because there is no real yield on anything in any sovereign debt. 
it's all underwater because the inflation rates are far higher than any yield on anything. And we've gotten so backwards in our thinking that you have a European debt that gives you negative interest rate. I mean, this is something that someone like me or a lot of people with common sense would say, this could never happen. You know, How can you have the future value of money be guaranteed to be less than it is today? And of course, that's what a negative yield provides you. So John, your final word, thank you for reaching out again. I think this is a very good presentation. My main edict for these public interviews is always to try and get people to think. Yeah, it's been my honor to visit with you, David. Um, I like the story you broke recently on the recycled project. All right. And I, I, I want to hear more about that. Will you let the pickaxe write a story on that? Sure. Yeah, I'll put you in touch with the company. That might be good to get another pen on, pen to paper on it. I'm really the only one that's given it much coverage at all. It would be nice to see how you take a look at it and how you analyze it when you have to say. That would be great. I'll, I'll make that happen. Okay. Well, have a golden afternoon. Right. No pun intended. And take care. Stay awesome, David. Well, thank you.